Create content that attracts, converts, and keeps your ideal clients. This is Content Cells. Hi, you're listening to the Content Cells podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal clients. Welcome to episode 155. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co host, Michelle Falzon. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey, Susie, I am feeling very super today. Super. I love that. That's one of my favorite words, actually. I use that quite a lot. <laughs> well, we have got something. Well, you are a super, superhero. I, I do say super duper. <laughs> now, we have got something uh, really special planned for our listeners today. We sure do. We have a very special guest on the show today, and it's someone uh, I absolutely adore and admire mm. and uh, somebody we're really excited to have with you have with us both today. I'm very excited. And this is actually a returning guest. Um, You loved her the first time. You're going to love her even more today. Um, Do you want to tell us a little bit about who it is, Michelle? Sure. Now, uh, her name is Victoria Labam, and she helps people express their hidden genius and perform at their highest levels in work, on stage, on camera, and in life. And she's got a really fascinating combination of skills and this incredible history that's kind of come together to create this really unique perspective on the world. She's got a background in performing arts, speaking, presentation and business skills, and there's this really unique and powerful view of the world that she's got as a result of that. She's a member of the Speaker Hall of Fame. Uh, she's known for her keynote performances and workshops all around the world. In fact, she's her systems and strategies have been embraced by more than 700 organizations. And when you look at the people that she's worked with, Susie, it's like the who's who. Mm. It's like Starbucks and Microsoft and Intel and Verizon and Coca-Cola and Cisco and Oracle and Chase and L'Oreal and PayPal. And I could go on and on and on, plus lots of, um, you know, big name universities, institutions and not-for-profits. And she's also the person that people call on when they need a trusted consultant to help them, help coach them through like a really high stakes presentation, really hit that out of the park. And she's coached hundreds of elite individuals for high stakes keynotes, uh, you know, live streams to tens, hundreds of thousands of people, PBS specials. Oprah's super soul session. She coached somebody who had a speaking gig. Imagine that, Susie, a speaking gig on Oprah's super soul. Um, She's helped people do major C-suite presentations, arena style events. Like she is the go-to person if you've got a big high stakes presentation. Also, that's not all. She's a creative artist. So her films, performances, (laughs) theatre projects, they've received critical acclaim from the likes of The Hollywood Reporter, you know, just little publications like the New York Times and Variety, um, BBC, CBS, Los Angeles Times and Good Morning America. And Victoria is also the founder of Risk Forward and Rock the Room, which is a full suite of products designed to help people and organisations uncover and express their original ideas. And just because, you know, she had nothing else to do, she's also (laughs) written a beautiful new book. Uh, It is truly amazing called Risk Forward. Wow. I, you know, I knew a a little bit about Victoria, but I hadn't heard all of that, all those big name brands, all those accolades. Rockstar, there's a rock star in the room. Rockstar. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's uh, go ahead and um, bring Victoria in on this conversation. Hi, Victoria. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Content Sales Podcast. It's great to have you here. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited to be here. Well, you've been on the show before and I remember how popular that episode was and I'm sure our listeners are absolutely going to love uh, what we're talking about here today. And what That's we're talking good. about here today is this concept of risking forward. V, I want to just dive right in because you have written a book on this topic. Tell us what led you to write your book, Risk Forward. What led me to write the book is that as I went around the globe, really talking to different groups, working with executive teams, working with entrepreneurs of every type of background, small business owners, uh, people who are artists, I discovered that there was this unspoken pressure that people felt to always be clear and always have a plan and a goal, and that they felt held back when they weren't sure where they were going. And yet I discovered through working with all types of successful individuals and corporations and creative companies that 
a lot of the leaders didn't know always where they were going. So I wanted to address this topic, which is risking forward, which means heading out into the unknown, even if you're not 100% clear where things are going to go. So heading out into the unknown, even if you're not sure where things are going to go. That sounds very courageous. Why is this message so important right now? Well, I believe that this specifically right now, of course, with the pandemic, because we're in a period of transition as an entire you know, planet, really. Uh, and so we're facing something we've never faced before. This is a huge opportunity for people to reevaluate their decisions, to reevaluate parts of their lives, and also to finally realize, you know, there's nothing quite certain. And this is a wonderful reason to go forward with what we most are excited about, to try things in our own way, because the time is now. I love that, trying things in our own way. And I think that's very relevant to our listeners. So v, most Victoria, most of our listeners are small business owners and they tune into this show to learn more about content marketing. And that involves putting themselves out there as experts, sharing their stories, sharing their client stories, taking their ideas and packaging them up and selling them and putting a value on them out there in the world. So I'm interested, how can Risking Forward help our listeners? What tips would you give them specifically around their marketing, their content marketing and Risking Forward? Absolutely. So as a small business owner, you're in a wonderful position because you are the captain of the ship. And so you can pivot and turn in the directions that you want to go. Uh, there's a lot of homogeneity out in the market of small business owners. And one of the things that Risk Forward helps people to do is to express their ideas in their own unique way. And that's a big marketing angle. It's a distinction factor for you to be different from other people, not because you're trying to be different, but because it's truly who you are. So for small business owners, there are all types of sections in the book. There's one of my favorites. It's called the prism effect, which is that in each of us is a full spectrum, if you will, of colors. And this is all about how do we take the angles, the ideas, the past, the passions that we have that are unique to us and put them forward in our business, whether it's in our web collateral or the examples that we use, the stories that we tell to distinguish ourselves from everyone else. Could you talk a little bit more about this full spectrum? Because I think there's a really rich vein of inspiration people can get from this idea. Because when we're trying to come up with our ideas, when we're trying to come up with our content, when we're trying to put ourselves out there, people do look towards what everyone else is doing as a model. And then like you said, it ends up everybody's writing the same thing, putting out the same kind of blog, doing the same webinar. If I see the phrase, take your business to the next level, one more time, I'm going to stick a fork in my leg, you know? So tell, tell us a bit more about this full spectrum. Like, how do I bring more of myself to my content and why is that important? Absolutely. So uh, there's an example in the book, and it's always great to teach through examples and stories. And so, Michelle and uh, Susie, you probably both know this one from having read the book and also from all your experience with me. But Ryan Levesque, who's a great marketer and someone who runs right the Ask Method, had uh, been running his business you know, a little like others. And I'd said to him once we were talking, I said, what's an outside passion of yours that you have? And he said, well, I love Lego. And I said, great. What if you were to bring Lego into your business as a, a prop, as a gift, as an analogy? And at first he was hesitant because he thought, oh, it might not be taken seriously. But the truth is Lego lit him up. He knew a ton about Lego and he took this risk. He risked forward to put himself out there and tie the two together. And he came up with an analogy that connects Lego to marketing. As you know, Michelle, he started using Lego in his stage sets. He started giving it away as gifts. And it became a real distinguishing feature for him. So he separated his brand from everyone else. And it was fun for him. It's fun for his clients. And it makes his material memorable. I love that. And I do remember that example. And in fact, uh, I think my partner PJ still has a little Lego figurine on his desk <laughs> that he got from a, an event he uh, attended with Ryan. And going back to what you were saying about homogenous, and I see this every day working uh, with women, is we want to stand out. We say we want to stand out. We say we want to differentiate, but we're not necessarily risking forward because that sounds kind of scary. What 
so when someone's not clear on their path of how they're going to uh, move forward, where would you recommend that they start? Yeah, well, I always say begin from within. This is a core phrase, the start of the book, where we want to first off embrace the fog. And what I mean by that is that, you know, recognizing the fog is not necessarily a bad thing. So we don't want to try to run out of it as quickly as we can, which is what most people do when they're not sure. They grab the easiest marketing idea or the easiest business model because they don't like not knowing and they feel embarrassed. So they clam onto something and, and, and then they're kind of tied to it. So the first thing is to take your time to embrace the fog. As I say, like if you're in a field and it's foggy, the first thing you don't do is run. You're going to hit a tree or a rock. So you want to kind of be okay with not knowing and then begin from within. Say, you know, what would interest you? What would be fun for you? What would light you up? How could you do it in a way that would be fun? And if you start brainstorming with those questions, you'll come up with some fairly unique ideas. And then the step after that is to really start to try them out. I call it micro risk. So how can you try it out in a small way rather than redo everything like your whole website or, you know, commit to a gigantic project, say, let me do a, a small test run of this and see how it goes. I love that. And then you call that a micro risk. And yes. I love that because even in the term, it's like, well, you know, how bad could it be? <laughs> I'm just going to try, I'm just going to experiment for a little bit. And I love what right. you said about starting from within. Do you mind just telling me a little more about that? Yeah. Well, I believe that in each of us is what I call an inner current. Um, it is this, like a river, like uh, the current in an electrical wire. Uh, it's that force that moves through us, and I believe we each have that. Um, in the world of theater, it's called a through line, and it's something I've talked about for decades on stage, and it's the same idea here. It's this inner driving force within us, and I use the word current, inner current, because sometimes people think of it, oh, it's a theme or it's a topic or a goal, but a current has that sense of continuity, and so we want to reconnect with that. And there are ways to know we're on the inner current and ways to know we're off it. And we know we're on it when there's certain feelings that we have, like I'm curious or I'm excited, you know, or I'm feeling a little bit like nervous, but in a good way, right? I'm kind of like, ooh, you know, lit up. So those are signs. And there's a whole list of words in the book that we know we're on that inner current, that we know we're going in the right direction. We know we're off it when we're feeling like dread, you know, or we're feeling like a disinterested. And what happens in businesses, in small businesses, we feel forced to do what everyone else is doing. But maybe there's a better option for us. Like, oh, maybe you do the webinar in a different way, in a way that makes you excited. Like, what would be fun, right? And so we start from within. We pay attention to how something's feeling. That's one clue. I love that. And I do know myself, I feel when I'm on that current, you know, and I'm sure our listeners feel that too when we are doing work that lights us up when we feel we're bringing our full selves to our content or to our clients or to our meetings or to the way we're presenting ourselves to the world. So I love that. Um, so one thing, um, V, that you talk about in your new book, Risk Forward, is this idea of staying within the V. So you talk about full spectrum and yet there's also this idea of not going sort of too far outside your realm as well. It's kind of a balance. Do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So in the book, and the book is highly, highly visual. It's highly designed. It's an experience. And so when you get to this section called the V, there's literally a V on the page. And I won't reveal the whole experience of what happens to that V, but there's sort of an animated effect. And the idea of the V is not actually based on my name, Victoria, although that's a nice, convenient, <laughs> synergistic surprise, but it's really the idea that our vision, we think of a vision like a V, and we're at the point, and the vision is going outwards. And this is a little different than the full spectrum concept, because the full spectrum concept is in each of us is a whole range. So in the case of Ryan, it was Lego, right? Uh, in the case of Michelle, you know, you love flowers and you bring that in and you have these wonderful analogies. And so it's like, how can you bring in who you are, your, your farm? So the V is different in that when we are moving forward towards our vision, it's not always clear. That's the idea of risking forward. But it's 
clear within a, in a range. Like it's, it's, you know, if I am in my loft here, which is white with white walls and someone comes in and goes, let's paint them purple, dark purple. I immediately know that's outside my V, my vision. Right. But if someone says, why don't we, why don't we put a little gray trim around the edge that, that might be closer. And the key is to know which ones are taking you off and which ones are keeping you on. And the way we go back to knowing which is within the vision is even if we're not visually clear, we can sense it. We can feel it. We're like, ooh, that sounds exciting. Or, oh, no, that makes me feel dread. I love using the emotions as the barometer. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so good. Because I think that's what gets back to what you said, Susie, too, about we love the idea of being different, but we don't love the idea of risking, you know? And so this gives us a little bit of that barometer, a little bit of that sense of, okay, well, I can do those micro risks that V is talking about and just gradually bring a bit more of myself and pay attention to those emotions. So I love that. And V, you're talking about vision and you have some really interesting things to say about vision in the book and also about goal setting because obviously you know we often are taught we have a vision and then we set a bunch of goals to achieve that vision and I know for myself at times that's been a very helpful way to be and in fact we teach a lot of people about goal setting however two things can be true at the same time and there are some things about goal setting that I think you're bringing to the table that are really worth speaking about I'd love you to just share a little bit about your view of goal setting and risking forward. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm all for goals. I have many goals in my life. I have visions that I'm working towards. The challenge I think with goal setting is that it's taken as unequivocally a great thing, like especially in the business world, right? And people are like, got to have goals. You got to have goals. And so much so that people start to declare their goals before they're even sure they're the ones they want. And that's the issue I have with it because you see what I, you know, refer to in the book as goal contagion which is where people have (laughs) gotten each other's goals and adopted them as their own. It's like I have a program called Rock the Room where I teach people performance and presentation skills. And when I was doing VIP one-on-one coaching, people would come to me and they'd say, I want a TED Talk and a New York Times bestseller. And I would say, yeah, you and a thousand other people. Like, is that really your goal or did you just get that because that's what everyone else around you wants, right? Or in the entrepreneurial world, it's very popular these days, so it's fading to make these huge declarative statements like, I want to impact 100 million people by X date. And they're just pulling these random numbers out because it became kind of the fashion. It's like inappropriate to talk about money. So people talk about, quote, impact and like these big millions of numbers. But where did that come from? from. And so we hear these goals that other people have, or we set a goal, and we've all been there in our lives where we say, I want to make X amount of money, but we're miserable doing it because we're, the goal is like the tail wagging the dog. And so really what this part of the book is about is that goal setting can lead us astray. We just have to be very careful with where we plant that flag and how we approach it. And as a last thing I would say on that topic, and I have lots more I could say because it's something I feel strongly about, is that if we each think back, and anyone listening, if you think back on some of the best experiences of your life, how many of those were the result of setting a goal? So as I say in the book, don't let your goals get in the way of your life. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) It's so good. It is so good. Financial target. Any followers oh. we want on social media. So I think this is going to be a really part of the book for people to uh, explore. Earlier you mentioned captains of the ship. You talked about um, business owners being like captains of the ship. And as captains of the ship, we're not only setting goals, uh, and now we're going to have a new way to think about that, but also we're asked to be decisive. And usually that's a mark of a good leader is being able to say yes, no, this way, the other way. But in the book, Risk Forward, you say that decisiveness is actually overrated. Could you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very similar to my take on goals in that like goals are taken as always a good thing. And here, as you've just heard me say, it's it can be problematic. And the same thing with decisiveness. You know, I having worked with top leaders at companies like Starbucks, Microsoft, PayPal, having worked with entrepreneurs who are some of the biggest that we know and helping them in their presentations and strategy and how they think forward on their communication skills, I got the opportunity to be around these extraordinary business leaders. And what I discovered 
is that while on the surface they looked decisive, it was often after a lot of careful thought or a lot of careful experience. So the mistake that's sort of touted around in the, in the world is, you know, business leaders are decisive. They are, but it comes with great thought and care. And sometimes the decision comes quickly because they have the experience and the information so they can make a decision within a matter of minutes. But any great leader that I've talked to has often done their due diligence. They would be an irresponsible leader without it. So how, as I say in the book, how, <laughs> how great is decisiveness if the result is a poor decision? Right? And we've all done that where we've been forced to make a decision quickly because we want to look like we're clear and we're you know, not weak. Right. And we say, yes, I'll do it. And then we're off for months or years on a project that doesn't really light us up. And that's an opportunity cost. That's a resources cost. That's a time cost. It's all kinds of things that come from that. So it's really about when and how you make a decision. Got it. Mm, I remember, I, I don't know who to attribute this to, um, but a quote that I heard very early on in my business life was, it's very easy to open a door, but it's very hard to close the door once you've walked into the room. And, you know, I think that's true. You open the door on something, this is going to be great, and not realising this is now six months of your life or this is now five years of your life or whatever it might be. And so you made a quick decision. Like I'm going to write a book? Like that decision? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all know that's not, that's like a door you open and then you get inside and you go, OMG, what am I doing in here for a long time? Uh, and I yeah. know uh, the care you've taken, me with your book. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a good, it's a good lead into a story of a client I uh, had in the risk forward experience. And you know, we have in this experience in this community of amazing people. And she had come in and she had just started to put in motion a big project that had to do with taking care of a certain type of business owner. And it looked good from the outside and people were sort of encouraging her to do it. And so she was a little high on that kind of like, oh, everyone thinks it's a good idea. But as she realized through going through some of the book elements, it wasn't feeling great. It was feeling like a burden. It was feeling like something she dreaded. And she had the courage through the group to stop. And that courage to say no and not like, I'm going to charge forward mentality, she saved so much. And she said in retrospect, it probably saved her literally a million dollars. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. Her name's Renee Fink, and she just said the team costs, time costs, opportunity costs, it was a million dollar decision. But had she you know, stayed with it, uh, it would have been problematic. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Mm. Powerful it's also good mission, you know, for you gave her that permission, whereas she was wanting to stay consistent, which, you know, as leaders, we want to you know, keep our word and do our thing, but sometimes to our detriment, like you've just pointed out. Yeah. And, and part of that is just the, the illusion, go back to the initial question around decisiveness. It's the illusion that, oh, if I'm a good leader, I don't change my mind. But it's really how and when you do it. And if you come back to your team and you say, I've really thought about this and here's my reasoning. Uh, they will respect you for that. Uh, we, we've had that with the launch of the book when I was doing the launch, and Michelle, Michelle witnessed some of that. And just, you know, when you really think through something, um, it's sometimes hard to change, but ultimately, if it's the right angle, uh, it all works out. And I really, truly believe that. But I've seen a lot of unhappy business owners because they've just been marching to the tune of everyone else's drum. Mm and uh, the beat of everyone else's drum. And that's, that's a problem, mm, right? We, we have that back to the captain of the ship. You have that opportunity to do it in your own way and to, and to try something new, right? If that's what you want to do, to have the courage to leave what you've done before and try something new. Thank you. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about Risk Forward. I think there's a lot of nuances in this Risk Forward book and the concepts um, that we need right now uh, in the world because we are gung-ho in a lot of the ways. We don't have permission to stop. We don't have permission to say I've changed my mind. Uh, we don't have permission to say I don't know yet what I'm doing. I haven't got this all figured out. We're supposed to have everything figured out all the time. And so I love so much about what you are putting out into the world with this book. And right now, you know, we're coming 
into a full, you know, quite a long time of being in a pandemic situation. Uh, lots of people's lives have changed. Businesses have changed. We know there are people in our listener community who have had to completely pivot and transform their businesses. Some people are at, you know, high stress levels because shutdowns and all the different changes in the situation made life a bit unpredictable. How does Risk Forward help us in these times of great change and for people that are perhaps, you know, going through a period of great uncertainty right now? Yeah, well, as I like to say, I think we've always had uncertainty and what the pandemic has done is make it apparent because none of us has ever fully known if our health will be there or our loved ones will be there, or our business will be there, the weather will not have some disastrous, unexpected change. So really what it's done is highlighted the constant uncertainty we've always had beneath our feet, if you will. And I think in that way, it's made us a little more aware and appreciative of, of what, what we do have and appreciative of the fragility of what's around us. So for that, I think for all of us to recognize, as I say in the book, is a lot of people are scared. You know, we have this illusion that everyone else has it together. But I'll tell you, Again, having worked with some of the top people, and I say that only to prove that it happens at the top. You know, I've seen the CEOs of some of the biggest companies, the very well-known personalities in the arts, have fear and keep going and honor that. And so I just want anyone who's hearing this who also has fear not to think that they're wrong for having that. And risking forward works in two ways. I mean, risking forward is going forward, be, taking those micro risks to try something. Uh, risking forward is, is asking for the right people to help you. Risking forward, as we said earlier, is also saying no, having the courage to say no. Because what you're risking forward to do is to, to head into an unknown. You have an opportunity, whether it's a marriage proposal or a business proposal or anything in between, and you're thinking, That's not quite right. So I'm going to risk forward and really face the unknown because I have nothing specific yet in its place. We've seen a lot of women in our community have to change their idea about what business looked like and how they operated going from offline businesses to online businesses, you know, face-to-face businesses to having to figure out the whole all, you know, digital space. Uh, And that has been very confronting on top of closures and lockdowns. And we've certainly seen a lot of that in Australia. Um, One of the things that is very common is that, and something Michelle and I go on about is women being really specific about who they're for and who their ideal client is for. And I wanted to ask if there was, going back to what you were saying about homogenous, is there Anything that you would say to those women who are really broad in their focus, but they really want to have a more specialized focus, what from the risk forward message could they take that allows them to not feel like they're leaving the money on the table, but in fact, that they are actually doing something that's better for their business and their future? And you mean that by sort of niching down? Mm. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, this is a subject very close to my heart because I think sometimes, and this, this may be a surprise for some, but I think sometimes we're surprised by who our audience is. So that's the first thing I would say is sometimes we think it's a certain person and actually our message starts to resonate in a way we couldn't have anticipated. I'm a very good example of that. When I started speaking and I come from a background in the arts and I was a comedian and a painter and a dancer and a mover and a writer and a solo performer. And when I started doing keynotes, Very early on, the agents who booked me said, well, who's your target audience? And I said, well, I can tell you who it's not. You know, I'm sure it's it's not going to be like the tech companies and the insurance companies and the financial companies. Well, guess what? They became my biggest client. (laughs) Because it was so different. It was so different. And I started to use analogies from the arts to teach sales. I started to use analogies from, you know, mind to teach, you know, insurance and focus and, and it, just that disparate nature. So that's the first thing I would say. Sometimes there's a lot of pressure to, quote, pick your lane. And what I like to say is sometimes the lane picks you, you know. And I, so it's really initially about putting it out there and seeing who loves this message. Who needs this message? I mean, my book's another good example. Uh, I really thought in the beginning it was mostly going to resonate with women between 35 and, you know, 60 who were small business owners. 
And lo and behold, college kids are loving it. Kids who are in their teens and 20s are loving it. People in their 80s, men who are nine-figure business owners are loving it. So we often don't know. So that's the first thing I would say is, is see really, before you limit yourself, see who's out there. Because even if you're niched down in one way, because this is a niche down book in the sense it's specifically about not knowing, it has a broader audience than I would have thought. So it's kind of like that hourglass. You go through this tiny edge and then it kind of broadens out to someone you couldn't have imagined. Love it. Thank you so much. Mm. It reminds me of something that another one of our guests, um, Shelley Brander, said about the narrower you go. And the deeper into that narrow niche you go, the more expansive it actually becomes. And uh, you really made me think of that then, V. Um, Tell me, is there anything you'd like to say to people before we wrap up? What, If you could leave one parting message with our listeners, Victoria, what would that be? Well, it would be two things. It would be the opening line of the book and then a line shortly after. So it is this. Some people in life know exactly what they want to achieve. This is a book for the rest of us. And then secondarily, (laughs) I love it. (laughs) At the edge of not knowing is the beginning of the extraordinary. Mm, There's an inspirational message. Mm, Writing that one down. (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much I'm so excited to see um because uh, I know our community loved your message as I said last time you were on the show and so excited to share the book with them um and so grateful that you're here on the show with us thank you thank you thank you and for anyone who's looking for it if you go to riskforward.com forward slash book, you can find us. So just riskforward.com forward slash book. Or if you're completely lost, riskforward.com, you'll figure out your way. <laughs> <laughs> and do you've really risk forward with this book. I mean, it is not a usual book. It's highly visual. It is not the kind of book that people might be expecting. It's uh, absolutely a work of art. It's beautiful. It's beautifully printed. Yeah, people who have gotten an early access to the hardcover are just so pleased with it. They go, I'm going to keep this by my bed. I'm going to put it on my you know, shelf, on my special, special shelf. So yeah, it's, it's, it was created to be everyone's book, a real journal of a book. It's the kind of book that doesn't have a lot of other quotes on the back from other people endorsing it. So it feels like your book. It's, it's written to be the reader's book. Mm, beautiful. And it is. I'm, I'm really excited to see what our readers think of the book and highly encourage them to go and grab it at riskforward.com forward slash book. book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Victoria. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you for having me, Susie and Michelle. Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so good, right? It's just so... It's so important. I just feel like every time Victoria speaks, it's mm. like she's watering the garden, you know. We, I feel like we're we're out there in the world being told we've got to be more, do more, have more, make a decision, have a goal, be sorted out. And here comes somebody really wise who is telling us, yes, we can have and be everything we want to be and have, but it all comes from within. And we have a right mm. to say no. And we have a right to change direction. And we have a right to not no. Mm. I have a little quote that pops down out of my reminders every day and it says, uh, remember who you are and who you want to be. And I feel like Victoria's Mm. is that permission. That's part of the message is be who you are, like imbue your life and all that you do with who you are and really follow your own sort of, you know, internal compass. And I just felt that again, speaking with her today, just, Mm. you know, coming back to, what do I want? What does my ideal business look like? How do I want to express mm. myself? What sort of content do I want to make? And really leaving on the side of the road everything that is not in line with who I really am. So it was very, very powerful. I love that. And it makes me think about the one of the big things that I always get when I hear Victoria speak is when she talks about, you know, providing a, a full spectrum. And, you know, she talks about this prism of light, like white, bright white light is actually made up of all the colours of the rainbow. 
And so to make our light brighter, we need to bring all those colours. It's not just the one part of us that's organised or the one part of us that's funny or the one part of us that's um, loud and vivacious. You know, it's all the parts of us. And that example she gave with Ryan Levesque, who's another guest on the show, um, where he talked about Lego. And I can tell you, and as you know, Susie, that Lego thing was just such a powerful right. way mm. for him to reach his community, to be mm. seen differently to other people, to establish his particular unique way of being in the world. And there was so much leverage to be had from that. And so many, just from a content perspective, because I've helped Ryan with some of his content, um, just in the terms of the metaphors, like building things with Lego. It's right. kind of like building with a business. And then sometimes you have to break that building down. Um, you know, you need to read the instructions first before you build Lego. Well, guess what? When you come to one of his courses, that's like getting the instructions out of the box. There is so much scope when you just open the door on it. You don't know it's going to lead to there, mm. but it always does. That's, I think, Victoria's whole point. Mm. And it kind of um, flows very well with something that's sort of been um, ticking away in the back of my mind since she said it. And that was this, it's okay to change our mind. And I know that, you know, there's a there's a principle of uh, consistency and that we do like to stay consistent with our word. And this is a really powerful, actually, influence principle. But sometimes, and with great thought, the best thing we can do is change our mind. And just this morning, there's something we're working on right now, a promotion, and we decided we would go down one route uh, for one particular part of it. And then I woke up this morning thinking, oh, you know, that's going to be a whole lot of work for the team and it's probably not worth that. Um, now, me going back and changing my mind, does that make me an inconsistent, indecisive leader? Mm, I don't know. But I know that like the million-dollar saving, I mean, this won't be a million-dollar saving, but it will save the team a whole lot of time and energy because I'm willing to... Uh, risk what it might look like to change my mind, mm, uh, but mm. really backing myself to do that. Susie, there's a big light bulb that's just gone on above my head with what <laughs> you're speaking about. <laughs> I love it. I always get light bulbs when I speak with you and, and also having had that conversation just now with Victoria, I do think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about Cialdini's principles here on the show and the power of influence and the importance of consistency and, and what an influencer it is on our behaviour. You know, if we've said, yes, I'm all in for the show, we can't back out from the show when somebody says, well, okay, now you've got to pay for your ticket. We go, okay, well, here's my money, even though I don't really want to go anymore. <laughs> I guess I'm going to the show. Mm. Um but I think just listening to you then in the process you went through, I think you were being very consistent. It, I think it depends what we are anchoring our consistency to. So it might have seemed like a somewhat inconsistent strategy, but I, knowing you, I think you were being very consistent with who you are as a leader who cares about your team, as somebody who's always learning and changing and shifting and being better and doing better. So for me, I just see that as a continuous improvement tweak that you just made mm, to your campaign yeah, rather right. than a Tony, a full circle, yeah. Yeah, great, great. Love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that light bulb. <laughs> oh, ding. <laughs> uh, uh, but this whole thing about uh, light globes and also not quite knowing, uh, I really love what Victoria had to say about embracing the fog. And mm. this idea, you know, it sort of comes off what you were saying about decisiveness. And, you know, Victoria was saying sometimes we just want to be decisive. Uh, and so we jump on a decision without it knowing whether it's the the decision for us or not. And rushing out of that fog, oh, my goodness, that is such a recipe for disaster. Right. <laughs> um, you know, like Victoria said, you'll stub your toe or you'll, you'll trip on a chair or whatever. Um, oftentimes I've rushed out of the fog and um, absolutely met with calamity. And, and I think that the territory we're in now with this whole topic of risk forward, it is a nuanced territory because there have been times when I've been in the fog and I've been able to be very decisive anyway through my intuition mm. or my experience or a great piece of advice that I got from a mentor has helped me to, you know, get out of that fog pretty quickly. But I think when I've hit trouble is when I have been trying to escape the fog without really, you know, that whole it, it all begins from within without mm. really tuning in, mm. um, that's when I think we get into trouble. I, I think it's fine to, to do things when you're not completely sure. I mean, I think that's the whole point of Victoria's book, mm. but it's okay to be in the fog. It's okay to not know and, and it's okay to not make a decision 
just to get out of the fog? It is so nuanced because, you know, when mm. um, I'm in the fog and I want to move forward, um, what is sort of sitting in the way is the emotion. And so, mm. again, I think there's so many layers to what Victoria is saying because, you know, paying attention, like I might feel something and think, oh, I don't know if I'm making the right decision or I feel fear mm. or I feel stuck or um, and there's paying attention to the emotion knowing that, oh, it's so tricky. It's like paying attention mm-hmm. to the emotion, noticing what's mine and what might be someone else's fear projected onto me, right? Yeah. And then mm-hmm. also knowing that, you know what, I can just take, trust my gut if and if something is saying yes is taking that micro risk. So I've kind of, there's a couple of things that Victoria said mm. that I can see working together. But I think with the emotion, sometimes for me, I think, oh, I don't feel good about this, but I've, I'm in the fog. I don't know why I don't feel good about it. I can't pinpoint it. And sometimes I negate mm-hmm. the feeling because I can't pinpoint what is yeah. causing the fog. And so I think there's a lot to untangle there. Um, and I'm, I'm just very excited to do that and to dive into the book and to just get her, obviously, experience of the nuances of the role that emotion plays when we're risking forward, of what it is to take a small risk and see that through in order to keep the momentum going. Um mm. Yeah, even if you are still, if it's still a bit foggy, but I'm taking small steps. I'm stay, taking micro risks and I'm moving forward. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, it's a very lightweight book in terms of it's 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 not a lot of pages and uh, it's very spacious. There's beautiful drawings, hand drawings in there from Victoria, her own artwork. There's colour. Oh, that's there's cool. spaciousness. Yeah. And um, yet it packs a punch. There is so much meaning in this book. And I feel like it's a book I just need to keep reading over because of these nuances, because of the thoughts it's stirring up. Um, And like you said, you know, you can't wait to kind of think some more about this nugget of thought that's come up for you. And it's like that through the whole book. It's, you know, they sort of say, um, I forget who said it, and I think it's been attributed to five different people, but um, the gist of it is I'd have written you a shorter note, but I mm. ran out of time. Mm, and mm. what Victoria's done is she's taken the time to get through the long, long-winded thinking and get down to the nut of it, she's written us this shorter note. And it is a beautiful shorter note. Um, and everything's rich. Every page is rich with meaning and something you could just ponder on for the day. And, and I, you know, I, I know we've both been lucky enough to see the, the, um, the pre-release copies as well. And it's definitely something to ruminate on, to meditate on, to continue to go back to. And like Victoria said, I think this is one I'm keeping by my bedside table for a long time. <laughs> I love it. I um, have seen, you know, the advanced copy just digitally, but I want it in my hands. I want to feel the paper quality. I want to, um, you know, have it because it lo- sounds like something that you can just dip into when things pop up when you feel that point of, mm. oh, I'm not risking forward. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I'm going to give everyone the address again so that, that you can go ahead and order your book now. So head over to riskforward.com forward slash book, riskforward.com forward slash book. The book is available through all the usual um, online retailers and, in, you know, so go ahead and grab your copy. Now, we mentioned a few different things throughout the episode. So we have also created a show notes that um, complements today's episode and you'll find that over at herbusiness.com forward slash risk forward book herbusiness.com forward slash risk forward book and so we'll put on there uh, any other references um, that we made along the way and of course on that page will also be a little more about victoria and a link to purchase the book as well love it (sighs) So good. All righty. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, then you will totally understand why I am going to recommend that um, you share this episode uh, with a friend. Um, we love sharing the tips inside of these episodes with as many business owners as possible. And what really helps is one, you sharing the episode. Two, is leaving a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. So if you enjoyed today's episode or any episode of this show, we would love it if we would leave you, if you would leave us rather, (laughs) we'd leave you a review (laughs) if you you needed one, but if you could leave one for us, that'd be great. Um, And just recently, we did have a couple of our listeners, uh, Geraldine Gallagher and Joe Clark, um, leave comments for us. 
on the episode, which has turned out to be really popular, a couple of episodes we did about online courses um, very recently because so many business owners are diving into the world of online courses and they um, don't want to get um, derailed. Uh, and so the comments are, as such. Geraldine said, thanks so much, Susie and Michelle. This is just what I was looking for. I've listened to the first one. Uh, now ready for more. Bring on um, 2021 for online courses. So Geraldine is diving into creating her online course and she found those episodes really helpful, as did Joe Clark, who said that was so helpful and timely. Thank you. And both Geraldine and Joe are members of the Her Business Network and now um, also listeners of the Content Sales Podcast. Thank you to both of you. Mm, thank you so much. I love hearing when people love our episodes and get something from it. And they're actually doing courses right now. So it's relevant. I love that. Mm. So um, those couple of comments actually were left on our Content Sales Podcast Facebook page. So if you haven't been across there, this is a great place to ask questions and get quick responses from me, Michelle, and then just head over to Facebook and look for Content Sales Podcast and you will find it. Michelle, what do we have coming up in the next episode? Susie, the next episode, it's all about how to optimize your marketing funnel. So we've talked mm. a lot on the show about encouraging people to get a marketing funnel up and running. And it's, you know, woohoo, happy days when you actually do get that funnel started. But we want to let you know that's just the start. You very rarely get it 100% right out of the gate. Even the masters do not get that 100% success rate. Um, there are usually parts of the funnel where people might be getting stuck or dropping off or pages that aren't converting at the level you want or emails that get, aren't getting opened or whatever it might be. So how do you go about optimizing your funnel? What do you focus on first? And what are the red herrings that can take you off track and suck a whole lot of time without making much of an impact in the results you're getting in your funnel? Well, we're going to reveal all of that and more in our next episode. I know that is going to be a cracker of an episode because mm. like you, we see these funnels created and they're broken and it's not always easy to see where they're broken. But when, you know, someone like Michelle who is helping people create these amazing funnels all the time and, um, you know, we're running funnels and noticing where they're broken and having to optimize them, um, there's going to be lots that we can share that's going to help you, as Michelle said, not only optimize your funnel, but know what to focus on next in order to make it work better. That is coming up two weeks from now. If you don't already subscribe to the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go today? A special thanks to Victoria Labalm. And really, this is a really very, very special book. I'm sure already just from listening to her today, you're convinced to go out and get it. But I it gives it gets my highest personal recommendation. And that's you can get that over at riskforward.com forward slash book. Here's to risking forward, Susie. Here is to risking forward. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, thank you. Big thank you to Victoria uh, for joining us. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time on the Content Sales Podcast. Bye for now.